We've all heard of the career publicist before, but what exactly does a publicist do? Well, today's guest may actually know a thing or two. Steve Rohr has represented the Oscars as a show publicist in the past, and he now owns his own public relations firm. Today's episode is brought to you by Wani Wei. Wani Wei invented the high quality wireless music powering Bluetooth. Never miss a beat with their Eclipse series true wireless earbuds. Hey guys, it's Aaliyah and welcome back to another episode of 24-7. Today I am here with Steve Rohr. He is a communication expert, he is a professor, he is a PR extraordinaire, and he is a best-selling author. Thank you so much for coming in today. Obviously, you wear quite a few hats, so thank you for taking the time today to come visit us. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And we'll touch on all of your occupations a little later, but I First and foremost, I just want to know, like, who is Steve Rohr as a person? Like, what are some of your personality traits? What are some of your values and beliefs? Well, I'm a nap taker. <laughs> <laughs> because when you started listing off all those things, I thought, my gosh, it's exhausting. <laughs> you know what? I'm a guy from a small town and got super lucky mm -hmm. in life. You know, worked hard, but, you know, I have a strong faith mm -hmm. and... I was able to get further than I'd ever thought, actually, in my career. I'm, I'm from Montana, which is, do you know where that is? Uh, yeah, I actually do. You do? <laughs> You're like one of five people who knows what Montana is. And now I live in Los Angeles right. and work in the entertainment industry, which is so far away from where I, I grew up and, and what I knew. Right. But hopefully my values stayed along the way. And uh, let's talk a little bit more on your occupations, as mentioned, you are communication extraordinaire. You are a... You How am I doing now, though? You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't, to I be don't honest... Know, maybe, maybe that hat has just been taken away No, to me. be honest, okay. I'm sitting here. I was telling our cameraman, I'm very nervous because I'm going to be sitting across from someone who is an incredible communicator, and that's supposed to be my job. But now so. after a minute, you're like, you know what? <laughs> you know what? I'm so much better than he is. Thank you. But I, I, I grew up talking mm -hmm. and didn't stop and haven't stopped. The communication moniker is overseas and is a headline for my life and all the careers that fall under it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a publicist, right. Hollywood publicist. I represent actors and recording artists and have for 20 years, <laughs> 20 years. So basically an agent that oversees their press. So when they do a movie, they do a TV show, they write a book, I help coordinate all of their interviews and make sure they get where they need to go. And they're usually sitting where I am. And I was also the publicist for the Academy Awards oh, for several years. Incredible, yeah. Now when I say it, I still think, how did that happen? Right. Like, I'm still that 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? They put me in charge of something like that? But, you know, really, it, it, it was a huge honor. And uh, the, it's all teamwork, of course. So with all these jobs that you're juggling, what does a typical day look like for you? Or is there nothing typical about any There's of nothing days? typical about it, but that's the best part. Right. You know, when I was growing up, I just, I thought the worst, the, the worst thing I could happen in my life was, if I had a routine, the same thing day in and day out, where I live for the weekend. You know, people say, you know, I'm living for the weekend. Right. I thought, why would you live for the weekend? Like, your entire week is so much more impactful to your overall life. And I always wanted something to be creative, something to be different, mm -hmm. entertaining. I never really wanted to grow up. Hence, yes, here I am. Still hopefully thinking uh, like a kid in many ways, much the chagrin of my family and friends. But, uh, gosh, I just wanted things to be uh, new, different, exciting every day. And that's what I got. I got that. Cool. Let's talk about your experience, particularly in PR, because I feel like it's a job that a lot of people may be interested in, but they really don't know how it operates behind the scenes. So let's start from the beginning. You said you're from Montana. Yes. What made you want to move out here to Los Angeles? Was it to pursue PR? Or no, I had no idea what. <laughs> I had no idea about anything, like anything. Okay. I didn't know what a publicist was. 
And even now, when I tell people I'm a publicist, they think that I publish books. <laughs> when I tell people I'm a journalist, they think that I'm a writer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and it's like, I, that's nice, yeah. but that's not really what I, I do. I moved out here again because I wanted a different kind of life. I didn't know what it would look like. I took a leap of faith and tried a lot of different things. And publicity literally fell into my world. Literally fell into my Wait, world. what do you mean by that? Like, how does that just happen? I know. <laughs> I'd like that to happen to me. I, I know. <laughs> well, okay. So I was struggling okay. trying to figure out where I belonged, what I wanted to do. I had this, this drive. Mm -hmm. I thought, my gosh, I'm here and I'm in L.A. and I really don't want to go home, big loser. And nothing was working. Nothing was working. You know, finally I got an internship and was working in, in news. Mm -hmm. Still, that just didn't, that just didn't pop for me. It just really wasn't, it, it wasn't sinking in for me. And I, I, I got to a really low point. Really, I got mm -hmm. to a really low point. I, you know, this town is full of, you know, depressed people. <laughs> really? Because it's freaking hard. It's really hard. People don't understand that 120,000 actors move to Los Angeles every year. Is that true? It is I mean, true. I believe it. It but... is true. <laughs> and then that's just actors. So anybody else, like a writer, a director, producer, editor, sound person, people are moving from all over the world to come to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many jobs and very few people make it. When you really look at the statistics, very few people make it. So I was feeling that. <laughs> I was oh, like, I oh, dang, this is, not, <laughs> this is not working out yeah. so great yeah. for me. Yet I still had that drive, and I still thought, my gosh, I still I want to do something. Mm -hmm. And I prayed. Mm -hmm. I, pr I finally humbled myself. <laughs> <laughs> And God is like, seriously? Because uh, we've been waiting for you to make oh. this call. And I said, look, God, you can see into my heart. Like, I am desperate. Like, this is the, it's not good. It's really not good. So whatever you see for me, whatever you see for me, I don't care if you, you say go to Iowa and, and work in a field. Mm -hmm. Like, fine. Just tell me what you see for me. Right. The next day, Ilya, the next day, I got a call from an actor named Christoph St. John. Now, Christoph has passed away since, but he was on Young and the Restless. Okay. And he said, look, I need a publicist. Wow. I said, why are you calling me? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even, like, I don't know what, what? Right. And he's like, well, you talk good, you write good. And I said, Christoph, seriously, I'm not your guy, I'm not your good guy and he's like you know I'll pay you and I said where do I sign up <laughs> and then within two weeks I had five clients wow. I was moving into an office in Century City which is a really nice part of Los Angeles yes, yeah. I didn't pay rent there for six months nice. like the whole thing was yeah. God's answer to me yeah. like God finally said well you finally you idiot. <laughs> he probably didn't say, maybe he did. He probably should have. You idiot. Like, you opened yourself up. Right. You humbled yourself, and here you are. And it's, it's been like that for me. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. I can definitely relate as a host trying to make it out here it's in LA. Hard. It's so hard. It's and hard. I've, I've had those conversations with God where I've been like, I don't even care if I'm like training dolphins somewhere as long as I'm happy because there's times where I've definitely like questioned well, whether my resilience is like. That's it yeah. though. That's a, it's a gigantic test. And I am like really stubborn. Mm -hmm. So it took me a long <laughs> time because there was always a part of me saying, but I just really secretly want what I want. Same. Yeah. yeah, it's like that little piece of you, like uh, anything you say, but I really want to be a journalist. <laughs> anything yeah. you say, but I really want to be an actor. But anything you say, but then that day, I just was, I was done. I was completely done. Dang. Well, that's incredible. So have you had the role of a uh, publicist and a uh, public relations executive? Like, can you walk us through the types of publicists that there are out there? Yeah, they're all kinds. Yeah. They're okay, all let's... kinds. So I am 
professionally, I'm a talent publicist or okay. a personal publicist. Okay. I re represent actors and recording artists, so people. Okay. So one of my clients is Tyrese Gibson. Okay. So he had a movie called Fast 9, which came out. So we worked on the press for him. I have a, a client on Euphoria. I had a client on, on Babysitter's Club. Mm -hmm. So we work with the network. We work with the studio in lining up the press and making sure that they feel great when they walk into those interviews. And you were able to generate worldwide like <laughs> recognition and publicity for the Oscars, which is a huge deal. You did that for several years. Well, that wasn't just me, by the way. <laughs> like, it, it takes a village in the state of Texas, well, really. Even just being like a part of that. I was a small part of it, but yeah, <laughs> major team, major, major team. But huge honor, mm -hmm. huge honor just being there. You know, I went to the Oscars 12 times. That's incredible. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. How do you even deal with Like, my town doesn't have a stoplight. <laughs> like, like, what? Yeah. How do you deal with the stresses that come with representing an event of that magnitude? Well, you cry. <laughs> for starters, no. You know what? It, I, in, in my life, thankfully, I don't think that I've ever gone to a, a level that I, I couldn't handle. And I don't think that's me, by the way. Mm -hmm. But once I got to a level that I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy, I was able to handle it because of something that happened prior. Got it. You know, it's still stressful because you don't want to mess up the Oscars, right? Right. It's like after 90 years, you come in, <laughs> you're like on your watch. So on a scale of 1 to 10 today, with all of the experience that you've accumulated, how stressful would you say your job is? Well, it is it's the number two most stressful, I think, after air traffic controllers. Wow. It, it's, it's tough. Well, because you're dealing with personalities. Exactly. And rightly so. They have their own stuff going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And they have their own anxieties, rightly so. It, it's managing that. So it's not representing toothpaste that doesn't right. talk to you back, like, <laughs> like, I'm not feeling great today, or I'm nervous about this, or, you know, so you're dealing with people, and that's part of the joy, too. I've been invited to into a lot of people's lives, and that's a huge privilege, mm -hmm. huge privilege. When you have these interactions with your clients that could sometimes maybe potentially be disrespectful, how do you compartmentalize, like, taking it personally and then... You know, my clients have not been disrespectful to okay. me, thankfully. <laughs> but, you know, I think you kind of choose your clients, they choose you. Okay. And so my clients are really great. I think when there's an issue of anxiety or nervousness, it can, it can, it can come off as being strident or fill in the blank. But it just really has to do with performance. Okay. You know, people want to do a good job. Right. They want to do a good job. And if they're not feeling it, if they've got something going on in their life, you just talk through it with them. Right. Because it, we're, it's movies. Like, it's a movie. That's true. Like, you know, it's a TV show. Okay, so everybody calm down. <laughs> like, relax. It's a TV show. Like, nobody's going to die today. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, so um, I want to know the logistics of getting one of your clients a televised interview. Can you take us from point A to point C? Well, first of all, media coaching. Okay. Because as we're sitting here now, you know this is a professional environment. Right. You can't just say whatever you want. Right. You could, but then people would be upset with you, <laughs> possibly, right. right? And it's, I say it's, a, it's an unnatural interaction disguised and we're pretending to be a natural conversation <laughs> but we wouldn't necessarily talk like this right. in you know hanging out in the house maybe we would mm -hmm. but probably not mm -hmm. we're still going to be a little bit more formal we're going to watch how we sit we're trying to not swear we're not trying to do anything <laughs> pick at our face or anything right, right? so we do media coaching okay. and we work with a client to understand the dynamic okay like what is your role and what is my role in this scenario. And then we we do mock interviews. We're like, hey, let's run through some let's run through some questions. So we come up with messaging for them. Mm -hmm. So that's really number one. That's the foundation of it because we don't want somebody to walk into an interview feeling 
bleh, or feeling unprepared. Right. Right? Because again, when you're sitting here, the lights are on, the cameras are on, a lot of times it's live interviews. It can be a, it can be a little crazy. Yeah. It can be a little crazy. How do we book clients? Well, it depends on who they are mm -hmm. and what they have to promote. There are different levels of television interviews. So when you have the, the news, like the network shows, right. are different from the Entertainment Tonight's, Access Hollywood, Extras of the World. Those are news magazine shows. Right. Then you have the morning shows like Today, Good Morning America, CBS Mornings. Mm -hmm. Ah, but then you also have the local programming. Here in LA, we have KTLA. Right. You know. Yeah. So there are different levels, and it depends on who your client is and where they're from. For example, if you have a client who is maybe not nationally known, but they're from, we have a client from Jacksonville, Florida, mm -hmm. maybe we can get them an interview on that, one of the local stations. Got it. Because local is different from national, obviously, and local can't compete with national when it comes to news. So they want as much local content as possible. Our own Jacksonville native is an actress in this show. Big, it's a big thing, right? Right. And then you gradually move them up the chain, higher and higher, because of the markets start at like 200. Right. New York is number one, right. LA is number two, Chicago is number three. You don't want to start your brand new client out in New York. That could be kind of deadly. <laughs> you want to get them ready. That goes back to the coaching, right? It's, it's a, it's choreographed. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's very choreographed. I mean, yeah, I had no idea it was that like meticulous. It is. <laughs> but I mean, rightfully so, right? Well, that's why I have a job. So <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness. Yay. Okay, yeah. so before we switch gears here, do you have any fun or exciting or crazy or wild stories that you'd like to share? Anything that comes to mind? Because it seems like a very exciting job. You do not you do not have to mention any names. Oh wow. <laughs> Oh my gosh, wild and crazy. Well, everything is, is sort of nuts, you know? Again, it goes back to that, I'm just a kid from a small town, right. and suddenly you're with really famous people. Like, you look at them and you think, oh my gosh, you're, you're Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> is she one of your clients? No, she's not, <laughs> but you'd look at her and you think, you're Meryl Streep. Right. But because of my Oscars experience and you know, all the award shows, you see people and you interact with them. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's quite something. It's quite something. But you also realize that they also have a human quality. Right. Stars are not like us, by the way. You know how people okay. say stars are like us? They're not like us. Okay, so <laughs> how are they different? Well, they might put their pants on the same way, but people treat them differently in good ways and bad ways. Right. And there's a lot of pressure. Right. There's a lot of pressure. And if you're really famous and you walk into a restaurant, like I've done with a famous client, 50 servers show up to help <laughs> you. Now when I walk into a restaurant on my own, 50 servers do not show up to help me. And I know that's why stars are not like us, right? That's true. And you get away with a lot. And stars are given a lot mm -hmm. and entree to all kinds of opportunities. Right. And that changes your mindset. Oh, absolutely, I'm sure. Yeah. So one of the things that we really instill in our clients from the beginning, especially if they're younger, is fame is just a tool. It's a tool. It doesn't make you prettier, smarter, doesn't solve any of your problems. It's just a tool. So we're working on fame as a tool for you to open more doors to create more opportunities right. for you for work and maybe provide you a platform where you can tell a story about puppies or helping sick kids. <laughs> but fame is a tool. When you forget that, or if you forget that, it's, it's a slippery slope. Right. Because then you start feeling special. You start feeling very special. You are special, but you're no more special than anyone else in the room doing their job some great advice. <laughs> Has it ever come to a point where you had to let somebody go because their ego was just through the roof and they were unmanageable at that point? Who's watching this? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to name any names, but I'm saying is that something that 
can happen or that has happened well, in the past. Well, you know, if somebody does stops listening to you, your advice, that's why they pay you. That's why they hire right. you. Right. And if you're guiding them and they're not listening to your advice, you're useless to them. Right. Okay. So that's the only time that that would happen. And it usually, I don't know if it's ego or whatever it is that's right. going on in their life. Fortunately, that does not really happen to okay. me. Yeah. But they have to listen to you. They have to trust you. But you have to know what you're doing Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so let's switch gears here. I want to talk a little bit about networking because I think we can both agree that networking really does benefit yes. any worker. But for this particular occupation, this industry, it's absolutely necessary. It's a non-negotiable. It's the core of the job. So what are some um, effective networking strategies that have helped you maintain your success in the industry? Well, I'm a terrible networker. Really? Wait, how do you get by? I feel like that's... I don't know. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Okay, I can network, but I but it's not my innate okay. nature Are to you... work a room. I'm kind of shy, okay. actually. But what I do requires me to go out and be in public. So I do public speaking. Right. I do TV interviews or I'm out talking to people. I have to be out there. Networking, right? You have to put yourself but out I, there. you know, part of me really just wants to hang out and watch Netflix in my <laughs> sweats. Quite frankly, here's what I say to younger people, especially: mm -hmm. build your network before you need it. Okay. Most people will start to build their network a week or two weeks before they think they're going to make some sort of change. Right. For example, university students. Like, if they graduate in May, they'll start networking in May. Too late. Too late. So if you're looking to get into this business, not a performer, but behind the scenes, LinkedIn, go okay. to LinkedIn. And a lot of students will say, look, I, I'm not, I don't have anything to say. Well, we don't expect you to have a lot of stuff. <laughs> what, an ambassador to Sweden? Like, <laughs> if, if, what, what are you going to put on there? Just put real stuff on your LinkedIn and then start reaching out. And then you can ask for informational interviews, right? Right. Zoom is a great, great tool for that right now. But start linking in, linking in, connecting with people and following people, following people, following people. Also follow people on social media. Right. So when it comes to networking, you, you have to know what you're presenting, right? Why would I need, why would I talk to you? Like if somebody tries to link in with me, I have 16,500 LinkedIn connections. Isn't that ridiculous? That's crazy. I don't yeah. know these people. <laughs> but if it's a student, I will automatically link in with okay. them. Because I think, oh my gosh, they are now building their network before they need it. And that's really smart. No, they are not ambassador to Sweden. No, they're not, you know, CEO of Microsoft. But that's fine. They don't need to be. Social media, make sure it's clean. Right. So important. Because you're the product. And why would I want to connect with you? What is it about you that inspires me or makes me want to take any interest in you? Because usually if you're trying to network, you're coming from a place that is maybe not as elevated as where you're trying to network, right? right? So make it, make it appealing right. to the person. Do you have any other advice um, other than networking that you can maybe recommend to college students looking to land a job right after college? Yes, internships. Okay. Absolutely get an internship. Yeah. No question. Even if it's something that is not directly related to what you want to do. For example, if you want to be a publicist and you live in an area of the country where it ain't Hollywood, right? <laughs> you're, you're from like my town, right? They're like, what? So what do you do? You go to your local theater. Okay. And you say, can I work uh, back office? Can I work on marketing the next uh, local show that you're putting together? That's experience mm -hmm. that you can put on your resume. And that also means you get a recommendation from your boss because you did such a great job. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about now your role as a communication expert. Not only are you a speech coach, but you also touched on being a professor. You're also a best-selling author of the book, Scared Speechless, Nine Ways to Overcome Your Fears and Captivate Your Audience. Now, why did you feel the need to write a book like that? 
I can't write more than 200 words at any <laughs> given time. So it astounds me that I actually have a book. I taught and I continue to teach public speaking. And I found that the, the, the books that I was teaching from weren't necessarily, they weren't really connecting with me. And if they're not connecting with me as a professor, how can they be connecting with my students? Right. <laughs> and I felt like there were a lot of things that were not, not talked about, like nerves. I think nerves are awesome. I think nerves are natural. It's important to be nervous. Mm -hmm. If you're not nervous, you don't care. Think about that. No, for sure. If you don't yeah. care, like, why are you here? Right, exactly. So if you have a big speech or you have an interview and you're nervous, great. That means you're alive. That means you're breathing and you're passionate. There's nothing worse than somebody who is just blah, right? It just like, uh, welcome to our show. So what are some tips and tricks on how people can embrace their nervousness to ultimately give a better performance? Well, just know that you're going to get nervous and accept the nerves. Mm -hmm. Also, physiologically, things happen to us when we get nervous. I get a dry mouth. Same. Like, my mouth is so dry right now. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? Take a swig. Take a swig. So when I started doing live television... I would get this dry mouth and then they're like the, the gummy weird <laughs> right. thing and you're thinking, can they understand me right now? Because <laughs> I can't even understand me right now. <laughs> well, I would pop a lozenge in right before. So if you see it in my TV interviews, please don't Google them. But if you did, you'd see me crunch down like this right before I started talking because I was sucking on a lozenge. So I would not have a dry mouth. I feel like, don't those make your mouth, like, drier than they are? No, no? not the ones I have, girl. No. <laughs> like, I did research. I did research. <laughs> and also, no, like, things happen. So people right. say, oh, my face gets red. Okay. But yeah. usually, it, we're the only ones who notice it. Right. So we're being really obsessive about something that nobody cares about and nobody notices. Right? So physiological changes, just know they're going to happen adapt just adapt and be prepared there's no such thing as winging anything right okay so we touched on all these different hats that you wear out of all of them what do you think has been the most fulfilling i'm sure you're probably going to even add more in the future but i think the <laughs> most far. well i hope not because i'm super tired <laughs> i think the most fulfilling has been mentorship okay like mentoring Kids, basically. I mentor a lot of kids. Is that at the university? Or yes, and sometimes on... not. Okay. And watching them grow and develop and get theirs is really exciting for me, especially kids of color. Right. So if I am somebody that is seeking a mentor, let's say, I mean... Look, I'm all full up. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Okay, well, for people watching the show that are interested in a mentor that's not him... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What would be some recommendations? Let's say that the they're out of college already. So, right. so asking a professor isn't going to do it. But how would you recommend? You still ask that? a professor okay. because the professor might know somebody. Right. Think about how many students go through those classes. And the professors probably mentored some people who now are working in the industry or working great business. And they can connect people. Mm -hmm. Like if a professor called you and said, hey, I have another student who... Gosh, I need a little bit of guidance, and I know that you're this big mucky muck now. Would you mind talking to them? Well, yes, that, that'll, that'll be fine, and, and you can make those connections. I would absolutely do those informational interviews. Mm -hmm. Find somebody you really admire and connect with them and ask how they got started. Mm -hmm. Like, what is their secret to success? Right. But be a good mentee. Like, show up on time. Right. Be grateful. Right. Be like 50 in your head, even though you're 20. <laughs> like write a thank you card. What's a thank you card? It's actually a card where you sit down with a thing called a pen. Yeah. And you, no email, you, you no text. You have to like yeah. scrape it out and then put a stamp on it and then put it in the mail. And why do you do this? You do this because nobody else will. Some good advice. Nobody yeah. and else will. And it shows will. just a diff different level of intention. Of course. Yeah. And old people love getting mail. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I got some mail. I got some mail. They're so excited, right? Okay, like, so you mentioned um, the importance of bringing on mentees of color. 
why is that so important to you? Because I'm a person of color. Right. I mean, I, it was kind yeah. of an obvious answer, yeah. but if you want to elaborate a little well, bit Well, I didn't really see myself reflected anywhere right. in the media, any place, actually. Right. And when I, I did see myself reflected, it was in a negative, kind of stereotypical way. Mm -hmm. Like, it was always like a bumbling, nerdy computer guy, or it was just <laughs> horrible, right. horrible. And that bothered me. And that... You know, that stayed with me because I thought, my gosh, because then you start feeling like, wait, is this opportunity for me, for me, or is it for these other people who look this other way? And I think it's for everyone mm -hmm. who wants to achieve something and is willing to work hard. I do feel that kids of color, students of color, mm -hmm. have it harder Oh, like, I'm not going to apologize for oh, saying that. a thousand percent. Yeah. And just... I always say, you will have to work, if you're a woman of color, mm -hmm. you have to work 1,000 times harder. You have to be 1,000 times better, 1,000 times smarter, 1,000 <laughs> times more freaking yeah. amazing. Is it fair? No. But that's how it is. That's, yeah. So that's what you have to do. How the cookie crumbles. I mean, there's so many things institutionally that are just like embedded oh, yes. in our society. Oh, that, yes. Like, Everybody's yeah. like, we fixed it. You did? <laughs> when did you fix it? Here's the other thing that I, I, I tell kids of color who maybe come from a socioeconomic right. disparity, hardship, yeah. hardship. I say that, that time when they shut off your, your light bill, that time when you didn't have a lot of groceries, mm -hmm. that time when your mom was crying because... How is she going to pay all these bills? Mm -hmm. That's your superpower. I like that. That yeah. is your superpower. Yeah. <laughs> because you had to live that experience. Mm -hmm. And that made you into who you are. Do not apologize for growing up poor. Mm -hmm. There is no sin in being poor. Mm -hmm. The sin is if you don't want to be poor anymore and you don't do anything about it. Right. That's a sin. Allowing that narrative to That's dictate right. your life. Exactly. So when I... I I encourage kids to put on their applications, tell your story. If your dad raised you as a single dad, working three jobs as a custodian to put you through school so you can be the first in your generation to go to college, you put that in your letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's That powerful. is your superpower. We're not asking for a handout. Mm -hmm. We're not asking for pity. We're asking for parity. And we're asking for an opportunity. When you think of all the success that you've been able to accumulate in your life, looking back, is this kind of how you imagine things panning out? Like, have you always been ambitious and dedicated or was this kind of a muscle that you had to exercise? I was lazy for the first 35 years of my life. <laughs> oh, really? No. I, I got more than I thought I would. Okay. I expected a lot. I expected a lot from myself. But... I definitely got more than I ever thought I would. Mm -hmm. I've been sort of overblessed, you know? Right. Not without sacrifice, not without hard work. But I think that also comes with responsibility. Okay, so I want to shift gears here and talk about the future and what's next for you. Do you have any upcoming books that you're working on? I, I know told you, said you I don't that you, write. Yeah. Like... <laughs> okay, well, maybe upcoming projects, maybe some new clients. Um, any, I don't know, anything that you'd like to share that's going on? Well, I've been asked to speak a few times. Oh, yeah. Uh, Any upcoming year. speeches? Yeah, let's I hear about that. I have a, a few. They're the private events, but they're okay. uh, later on in the year. And I don't speak that often. Right. I, I enjoy doing it, but every couple of years I, I get to give a speech. I listened to your TED Talk, by the way. You did? Yeah, I thought it was really... Weird. Moving. No, it was moving. <laughs> and in the beginning, I was like, okay, where is this going? Yeah. And then it really, like, I could tell that you do obviously have training in speech, but the, the speech itself was just so, it really, like, connected in the end, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I tell stories, a lot of stories, and I don't do a traditional kind of speechifying. I, I, I tell stories, and I show how I look for patterns, and I show patterns. So when did you decide that you wanted to become a professional communicator and 
a, a public speaker. Like, did you take classes on that in college or? I did. Yeah. What I was did. your major in college, by the way? I didn't ask you. I had a double major okay. and a minor. So I was in communication, political science. Okay. And an art nice. minor. If you want me to paint you something, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just telling her. Because that was a minor. <laughs> I was telling her, I was a double major as well, and I was okay. telling our videographer that I was um, a broadcast journalism major and American studies major. Okay. And American studies is probably not going to make You never know. Money. <laughs> you never know. Because I, I feel like I use my political science degree yeah. more than my communication degree in Hollywood. Nice. Yeah, and I was telling him that now a lot of people are hiring like cultural advisors for That's right. movie sets That's and, right. and television shows. So. That's right. And I have a master's degree in communication as well. I have no idea how I got that, but it's, again, <laughs> a Christmas miracle. But that has helped me be able to teach, and that's, that's what I really enjoy. Okay, well, we want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come join us here on 24-7. I think all of our audience can really take pieces of this conversation and apply it not only to their professional life, but also to their personal life. So you've been great. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. And if you found this episode as inspirational as I did, be sure to like and subscribe and we'll catch you all next time.